Um, thanks, Vienna, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So let's get started. So I've been living in San Francisco now for about four years. And one weekend, I had taken a quick trip back to see some of my friends in another city. And on my way to the airport in the Uber, the Uber driver was talking to me about how much he likes to play pool and how often he plays pool. And I was sharing with him, too, about how I like to play pool a lot, or at least I used to, because back in college, we had a pool table in my freshman and sophomore dorm, and I would literally use any excuse to get out of my work. So I was there quite a bit. And he continued to talk about it, and he eventually told me about something called the APA, which stands for the American Pool, Pl uh, Pool Players Association. And the APA is a countrywide league in the United States. It um, is in each city, teams will play out of different bars and pool halls. And he said teams were always looking for new members and that there was this thing called a handicap system so that when anyone of a lower skill level is playing a higher skill level player, they don't need to win as many games. Basically, what he was trying to get across is that the league is very welcoming of new members no matter what level of experience they have. And so since I was new to San Francisco, this was a really appealing conversation to me because I didn't have many friends in the city and I didn't know the city all that well. So it occurred to me that probably the first thing I'm going to do when I land is sign up for this league so that I can explore the San Francisco Bay Area and make some new friends. So here we are, four years later. If you talk to any of my coworkers or even my friends, they'll probably tell you that I'm obsessed with pool, if you couldn't tell that already. So I'm on two teams in San Francisco, and three years ago, one of my teams and I, we went to Hawaii for a tournament. And actually, only just two weeks ago, I got back from Las Vegas and I was playing a national tournament with my doubles partner. And actually, one of the most exciting things, or at least I find the most exciting, is that three months ago, I got a pool table installed in my apartment and I continue to procrastinate on my work. When I work from home, I'm not so sure that I'm working from home. So you might see now why some of my friends call me obsessed with this sport. So hi, I'm Mars. I don't play pool all the time, and I'm certainly not a professional. But by day, I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix, where I work on the acquisition UI team. I've been there for about two years now, working on this team, and we focus primarily on our sign-up flow across different platforms. And for the majority of 2017, I spent my time refactoring and rewriting our sign-up flow. So today, I want to talk about what I learned from that experience, because re-architecting code is often hard and quite nebulous. First, it's hard to know where to start. And it can be, lots of overwhelm it can be overwhelming because there's lots of work to be done. You have to rethink or rewrite the way a whole code base was done before, and perhaps by more than one person. And it's also hard because you need to figure out how to move over the code base's feature set while balancing the current problems, as well as make sure that you make room and make it stable enough to put future features into the code base later on. And so to me, software re-architectures mean blending strategy with execution very carefully. And I haven't come across a good mental framework for how to blend these two things together until now. And that's where pool comes in for me, and perhaps for you as well, after I'm through with my talk. Because in my opinion, we can learn from it. We can borrow the same tactics that go into playing a game of pool to figure out how to blend strategy and execution when it comes to software engineering. So today, we're going to talk about what I learned from re-architecting our sign-up flow this past year at Netflix. And I'm going to start with some of the context behind why we decided to do that in the first place. And then I want to walk you through the steps involved in playing a game of pool and how that applies to software re-architectures. And then we're going to conclude at the end. So as many of you probably already know, at Netflix, we do a lot of A-B testing on our UIs. When we want to update them or add some sort of improvement, we usually come up with a general idea of something we think is going to be an improvement over what we currently have, and multiple designs or ways of expressing that idea in the UI. And while we'd hope that our intuition of working in the industry for quite a while now, as designers and engineers, we actually prefer data to relying on our intuition. 
So we're going to A-B test our UI implementations or our new improvements. Now, A-B testing at Netflix is kind of misleading because really we run tests with multiple variants. So think about it as more of A, B, C, D, E, and so on testing. So once we have our multiple designs, as engineers, we'll implement them, and we'll start running our test in production to see how our users are reacting to it. And once we have enough users seeing each variant of the test, enough that's going to make our data significant, we're going to pick a winning variant, and we're going to analyze the results. I'm sure some of you have heard about A-B testing on the member experience, but in sign up, when we A-B test something, our goals are slightly different. The first thing that we try to do is improve our rate of sign up. That one seems somewhat obvious. And the second is that we actually want to find more qualified members. We want to make sure that the people that we are signing up are going to stay on the service and subscription for longer. So for the past two or three years now, collectively, our team has been A-B testing the sign-up flow. And this is what our sign-up flow used to look like. We ask the user first to select a plan, and then we'll ask them for their email and password, and we'll also ask them for a method of payment. And in between every page here, we have a full page reload. This is what our sign-up flow looks like now. One of the most obvious differences is that it's red instead of blue, so we consider this more Netflix branded and therefore visually in line with the member experience. We have the same steps as the old flow before. We have added also some contextual pages before each step. And perhaps one of the most important technical details or differences between the old flow and the new flow is that this new one is a single page application. So the A-B test that we designed for the sign-up flow, as you can imagine, had many variants. And because I'm talking to you today, you can also imagine that one of those variants outperformed the old one. And so we decided to go through a step at Netflix that we call productization. This is a step where we take the code that was written for the A-B test, and we make sure that it's more stable for production in the long run. And also, we want to clean up all of the code re related to the other variants that did not win. And so the level of effort involved in productizing a test like this, or really any test, depends on the UI area or the scale of the test itself. In this particular case, when we decided to productize it, we decided to take the test code and rewrite it. Because this test was rather large, as you can imagine, and also this is an important area of the UI to our business. But you're probably wondering, if we just rewrote our code base for the A-B test, why are we rewriting it again? It's not just job security. And we did this for a couple of reasons. One is that when we A-B test things at Netflix, we often make compromises on the code quality and scalability. Because we don't know how they're going to perform against our UI at the time, we want to make sure that we don't invest too much time and resources into something that is not going to be productive for Netflix. Here, specifically, the compromises in code quality resulted in the way that we manage state on the client side. Our UI components were written in React, but we had implemented a homegrown data management system. So what ended up happening was that we had state and business logic all over the place. We had it at the top level of our application as well as sprinkled throughout our component tree. And over time, this became really hard to maintain and also very hard for other developers to figure out what's going on on the client side. It was also somewhat bug prone. Because as we were updating the test with new features or bug fixes, oftentimes we would need to add new state. And we wouldn't always add it in a way that was the same way people had added it before. So we thought that the best course of action was to just take this code base and rewrite it. Because the problem was just so ingrained throughout our code base. So we wanted to consolidate our state and make sure that we could manage it in one place. Also. We had future ideas for A-B tests, but we also had no idea exactly what they were going to look like. But we wanted to make sure that not only was the code base maintainable in the long run, but that it would support any experimentation that we wanted to do on top of it. And so this is where I came in, to help productize our new experience and re-architect the code base and take the A-B test code and make it more stable and extensible in the future. So re-architecting things is really hard, and this is often how I feel when I work on them. 
Not only is there a lot of work that you need to do in rewriting a code base, but as developers, I'm sure you know, we don't document things really well. So imagine trying to rewrite a code base that you have no idea how it works. Especially when we're in the middle of, UI, of testing a UI, the documentation can get lost very quickly. So how do you navigate a code base and try to figure out what the current feature set is, especially when it also includes code for other variants of the A-B test with features you no longer need to support? And to make things even more complicated, not only do we need to make sure that the we move the current feature set or over, but in order to set ourselves up and our team for success in the future, we want to rewrite it in a way that's going to make it add easy for other people to add new features to and experiment on top of in the future. This is also difficult when you have no idea what those A-B tests are going to look like, but you know for certain that you're going to run them. So how do we think about re-architecting code so that we can make the code base more stable and maintainable, but also extensible in the future? And here's where I want to bring pool in. In my time coding and playing pool, I've realized that they've come to in involve similar types of problem solving. In both, there's a clear end goal. And in each step along the way, you not only need to deal with the immediate problems on hand, but also be able to strategize about what your next step might be. And then execute the step that you're currently on in a way that's going to set you up well for the one after that or the one after that. So back to pool, which I think can be summarized as masterfully combining strategy and execution. And I want to show you how this applies to re-architecting code as well. So let's talk about the steps involved in playing a game of pool. So in playing a game of pool, I like to break it down into five steps. The first one is that you'd like to choose your lineup, and then you want to walk around the table. You want to find your way out, take your shot, and eventually you might need to repeat. And I'm going to go through each step one at a time, and I'm going to talk about what this means in the context of pool, and immediately follow that up with how it can be applied to software engineering, specifically the task of re-architecting code. So the first step is to choose your lineup. So like I mentioned, I'm in a league back in San Francisco. The league is made up of a collection of teams, and on a given night, two teams will go up against each other. Five members of one team will go up against five members of the other team in individual matches. So on a typical league night, the first thing that we like to do as a team is to choose our lineup. And we like to do it intelligently. So out of a team of about eight people or so, we pick five of our players that are going to eventually go up against five of their, the other team's players. We want to match up our players against their players based on our individual strengths and weaknesses and their individual strengths and weaknesses. In software engineering, we also need to be thoughtful about choosing our lineup intelligently. So here, when I say picking the right lineup, I really mean picking the right people and resources to work on a re-architecture that makes sense in relationship to the specific task at hand. Our opponent here is not actually another team, but it is the code base that we are currently working on and the code base that we want to get to. We want to, to pick our resources and our lineup intelligently so that we can take advantage of the different experiences and skill sets of the members on our team, especially to address the specific issues that we want to fix in the code base. And in our case, our UI components were written in React, like I mentioned before, and we had a lot of states sprinkled throughout our component tree, which was making the logic somewhat hard to follow and debug. Since this is our sign-up flow and we are doing a lot of A-B testing, like I mentioned, we not only want it to be extensible in the future, but we want to make sure that our components are reusable enough to be support multiple use cases. And this meant pulling the state out of our components and consolidating it in one place in our application. And so here's where I came in. I really love reusable UI components. I've actually given a talk about it a couple times, and this is why I was chosen as the part of the lineup to work on this project, so that we could take my experience having built reusable UI components in the past and what I learned from that about being thoughtful about where state is stored in your application. So after we choose our lineup, typically that's when all the fun begins, at least in pool. Um, so in the city, in the league, I play eight ball typically on a given night. And without going into too much detail about how this game works, I'm going to give just a very quick overview about how it about some of the rules. So in a game of eight ball, I'll be playing against one other opponent. 
And the goal of the game is to get the eight ball in after I've gotten all of the balls of a certain type in. So that could either be stripes or solids. And generally, my opponent and I will take turns at the table. And after someone misses or fouls, the table will turn over to the other player. <clears throat> so when it's my turn at the table, the first thing that I do is I typically walk around it. And I physically walk around it. And I do this for two reasons. One, I want to get a sense of all of the possible shots that I can take, given where the cue ball currently is on the table. And it's important to physically walk around to get an idea of this, because then I can see the table and all of the balls from new angles. And I can figure out not only which balls I can currently hit, but also get a better idea of what pockets they might go into. And secondly, walking around the table is going to give me a better idea of where all the balls are in relationship to each other. So basically, by walking around the table, the goal is to get a different perspective than the spot I was standing in when I first walked up to it. In the context of software engineering, the idea of walking around the table really means to get a better idea and understanding of the code base that you're working on before you dive into a rewrite. So essentially, I would like to figure out the project dependencies. I want to figure out what feature set that we're going to need to maintain. How is the code currently structured, and what is the context and history behind the implementation? Why was it done the way that it was done? So when working on signup, the test code, or the code base that I was diving into was primarily code written for the A-B test. And it was written quickly. And as you can imagine, since we were testing our signup flow for two to three years, the spec and designs for our test changed quite a lot over the lifespan of that test. So there wasn't a lot of time for documentation. And in order to get a good idea of the existing feature set, it involved a lot of digging around the code base to figure out what features we needed to support. This was also a good time to talk to some of the other engineers and designers who had worked on this team to get some of the context behind why things were tested. And the idea here is to get a very preliminary idea of what other parts of the signup flow we might want to test in the future. So by walking around the code base, I can not only figure out what features the code base currently supports, but in the process, I can identify issues with the implementation and make sure that I get context on the way that it was done because we want to know the problems that we need to fix before we can fix them and get a sense of where the code base might be headed in the future. In the developer community or in software engineering, walking around the table also means getting a lay of the land of all of the tools that are out there, as well as your own code base. Is there a tool out there that can solve the problem that you're trying to solve? And if so, which one is going to be the best for the job? Having walked around the, your, the table of your own code base, this should be relatively easy to answer. And so for sign up, we knew that we had to fix the way that we managed our state. And so we realized that we're going to need some sort of a flux framework. And this, we went this direction specifically because it's a data management framework that's well suited for React applications. So we figured out which flux implementations were out there. And we put together some information about which ones would be good for the job. And I'll go into which one we chose in the next step. So after I've walked around the table, and I've seen all of the possible shots I can take and where the shots are in relationship to each other, the next thing I actually have to do is choose the shot that I'm going to take next. And this is a very strategic step. I usually need to consider which balls I can hit now, but also consider my end goal, which is getting the eight ball in and me potentially being the first person to do it and winning the game. So this has a lot to do with the state of the table, actually. And this is going to change throughout the game. In an ideal world where I never miss and I always make 100% of my shots, I'm going to see where the eight ball is and work my way backwards from there and come up with a series of balls that are going to get me to that end goal. In this step, I need to come up with a run that's going to set me up well for the long-term success of getting the eight ball in. And when I say a run from now on, I generally mean a set of balls that I want to get in in a particular order. I want to figure out which shots are going to set me, set me up well to complete the run. And sometimes here, the easiest ball on the table is not the one that I want to make, because I want to make sure that I'm not going to block myself from being able to finish the run, and that I'm setting myself up well for getting to the next shot. So in code rewrites, we need to do a similar thing. When we have an overall idea of what the code base looks like after we've done our rewrite, 
I'm sorry, when we know what it looks like after we've done our previous step of walking around the table, we want to deal with the immediate problems at hand and also figure out how to get from where we are now to where we want to be. So like in pool, I find that it's often best to work backwards. It's best to figure out what the ideal state of your code base should be and work backwards from there. And so here on the left is kind of a very rough depiction of what our code base looked like when it was tested or used for the A-B test where we had state sprinkled throughout it. And on the right, we have the goal where state is consolidated into one place in the application. So knowing that the ideal is more centralized state and working our way backwards from that, we decided to introduce a flux framework like I mentioned earlier. And having walked around the table of the developer community, we know that that Flux framework or Flux implementation is going to be Redux. And we chose this for a couple reasons for this project. And one of them is that we'd like to have a small file size because at Netflix, we're mostly focused on performance. And another one, um, one of them is that it was easily extensible. In Redux, when we can have separate feature areas, we can also separate them into separate reducers. And when you add a feature, you can just add another reducer. You can also write custom Redux middleware for your application, and this was really appealing to us because we wanted our code base to be flexible enough for new features and A-B tests, especially when A-B tests might be written in a way that's not quite coherent with the current implementation. So now that we've walked around the table and we've found our way out and come up with our strategy, it's time to take our shot, and this is an execution step, while previous steps have mostly been strategic. So in pool, I have a run on the table in my mind, and that's my strategy. But I also need to execute. And I want to take into account the short term, and I might need to rethink my strategy a little bit. Which shots are currently doable for me at my skill level? And how many balls are left on the table? And can I really get all of the balls in and get the eight ball in at once? Maybe I can execute the run that I have in my mind fully, but sometimes there might not be a good series of balls to hit in order to get to the end of the game. And I'll break the table down in my mind into a series of smaller runs. I'll try to get a few balls in, and then maybe I'll try and play a defense so that I leave the opponent in a bad position, which will hopefully guarantee me another turn at the table. And while a defense isn't great in the short-term goal of getting all the balls in, it hopefully is going to get me closer to the longer-term goal of winning the game. And either way, it's time to hit something. In software engineering, we also need to have our strategy. When playing pool, I wonder, can I, from, can I win from where I currently am, or do I need to break the table up into a series of runs? And the software engineering equivalent of taking our shot is time to start coding. When we re rewriting the code base, we wanted to figure out if we could do the state refactor in one fell swoop, or if we should do it in a series of smaller efforts. And here we actually decided to break it up into smaller efforts. And we rewrote the signup flow one page at a time. And our new code was also going out to production one page at a time. And we did this for a couple reasons. First, it makes your code way easier to review for other developers and also very easy for them to reason about your work. They can have a better idea of what direction your code is going if you can explain it to them in smaller bite-sized pieces. Secondly, it made it very easy for us to work with our QA engineers to validate the signup flow as we went. So for every page that we rewrote, our QA engineers could then go through and validate that page to make sure that we had no regressions across all of the different user states that we support. So by breaking it up into smaller steps, we were able to get functional as well as technical feedback quickly. So in pool, let's say I've taken my shot, and more often than not, I might end up missing. And not just missing as in not getting a ball in, but perhaps my strategy didn't go to plan. In pool, there can be multiple factors that contribute to this. So one, the first one is probably my skill level. And the second is that different bars will impose different constraints on the way you play. So for example, one, one pool hall or bar might have walls that are closer to the table, which is going to make it harder to shoot certain shots. So we have to adjust mentally when we miss. And hopefully, I get another turn at the table. And when I do, I want to go through each step that I've done previously again. And it's important to go through each step again, because the state of the table has probably changed, probably based on what I've been doing, as well as the shots that my opponent has been taking. And like in pool, when we miss in software engineering, we also have to adjust. 
And when you're working on a refactor, what are some of the ways that we can miss? And the first one is more often than not, it's generally bugs. Also, tools and frameworks that we use in our re-architectures will impose different constraints on the work that we're doing. But we have to learn from these mistakes and iterate. By breaking the refactor down by one page of the signup flow at a time, it allowed us to figure out how and if we missed early on in the project. We could quickly learn from our mistakes, and we could adjust and repeat all of the steps again. And like in pool, it's important to go through each step again diligently because misses can actually expose more fundamental problems with your project or the way that you're thinking about your architecture. And so we might need to walk around the code base again and come up with a new strategy. So working incrementally allowed, actually, for faster and more productive iteration, because the early feedback was invaluable in order to make sure that we caught the problems quickly. And it was important for us to get the new code base right. So for us, it was worth the time investment and being diligent with how we were going through this re-architecture. So software re-architectures are still pretty hard. And it's hard to know where to start. There's a lot of work to do. And we need to balance fixing the current problems with supporting future work. But re-architecting code is a lot like playing pool. We need to find a way to be successful in the short term, as well as set ourselves up for longer term success. We need to be able to address the problems that are immediately in front of us and anticipate work that we're going to do in the future. So for me, this means blending strategy and execution. And we shouldn't have one without the other. And Pool provides a good mental framework for how to blend these two things, as well as concrete tactics that we can take from the sport and apply them to software engineering. So for software engineering, like in code rewrites, we need to choose our lineup, walk around the table, find our way out, take our shot, and sometimes repeat. Thank you. <laughs>